like to call to order the Winthrop Town Council meeting for April 16th, 2024. It is currently 6.02. We are in the DeLeo Senior Center. Roll call, please. Council Castaneri. Here. Council Munson. Council DeMarco. Council Swope. Here. Council Aiello. Here. Council DeRoss. Here. Vice President Belcha. Here. President Luteri. Here. Ask us all to rise, uh, yeah, rise for the pledge and please remain standing after the pledge. Led by Vice President Belcher. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation. Please remain standing. I'd like to have a moment of silence for Lieutenant Dave Massad. Dave passed away on Friday, April 12th, after a long battle with an illness. Lieutenant Massad was 69 years old and had served as a winter police officer for 44 years. Dave was hired as a reserve officer on July 22, 1980, and was appointed sergeant on August 22, 1983 and subsequently on February 27th, 1997, Dave was appointed Lieutenant. Since retirement in 2019, Lieutenant Lassad served as Special Police Officer until his passing. Dave was longtime supervisor of the patrol division and was very popular with his officers. He had the reputation of always caring for his officers before himself. He supervised many of Winter Police Community Policy Initiatives he was a regular at the yearly Special Olympics, always manning the grill. He started the first Winter Police Citizens Academy and supervised Winter Police's first mountain bike unit. Lieutenant Lassad had a love of the ocean, was a longtime Winter Yacht Club member. He also applied his oceanic skills to his job as supervisor of Winter Police Marine Unit and was an active member of the early years of the Harbor Planning Committee, serving as the police liaison. Dave earned a reputation as a worker in the department committing long hours on details, holiday, and special events, and showing he could provide a good life for what he devoted to and loved more than anything, his wife, Karen, and their four children, Christina, David, Michael, and Andrea. My deepest condolences to the entire Lassad family. Dave will be sorely missed throughout the entire community. Please take a moment. Please sit. <clears throat> Minutes from the April 2nd meeting have been distributed. Is there a motion to approve? Motion. motion. Motion by Vice President Belcher, second by Councilor Tassinari. Any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it. Motion is passed. General information and recommendations. We will be voting on a Precinct 1 Council, the first meeting in May, May 7th, I believe. Um, right now we have two candidates. And um, we will be asking questions of the candidates first meeting in May we encourage them to reach out to us if they have any questions the procedure will be simple it will be the first person to receive five votes will be uh, appointed councilor precinct one until the term expires public hearing we have none public comment first period of public comment there will be a second Yes, Karen. Um, Karen, I was speaking to you. I just have a question. Under the reports we have a Cape Cod Governmental Affairs Committee, can you just please explain what the issue is with that committee? Uh, we will have the chairman of the committee talk about that in his report. Thank you. Yes, that, uh, that committee was established a year and a half ago to work with surrounding communities, municipalities to help us in any endeavor we might see fit. And I'm sure Councillor Ayala will speak about it in his in his notes. Thank you. Uh, Tassinari, I'm sorry. All these Italians. Mr. Dowd, and if you if we can, please go up to the microphone for CAT. I'm sorry, I didn't mention it earlier. I noticed Jack Dowd Precinct One. I noticed on the uh, town website that there's another. Uh, intergovernmental strategy group.
group on there today. So there's two, and they both have the same uh, members. I'm wondering uh, if there are two. Uh, no, there's one subcommittee. It must be a mistake, Denise. There's only one on the yeah, there's one. There should be only one on the website for subcommittee standing committees for the town council for 2020. Which, which one are we uh, are going to use? The strategy one or the uh, affairs committee? As I'm concerned, it's the intergovernmental committee. That's it. There's no strategy. Affairs committee. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I want everybody to notice that uh, Joe Aiello does not have his um, teacup in front of him tonight. Uh, I found that very offensive, uh, Joe, to, to be uh, making fun of uh, a very serious matter. Uh, there was a uh, survey done on Facebook by a, a backer of the year's vote, and he only had it up for a couple of days because the consensus was uh, no 197 and yes 13. And, the, and then they took it right off the Facebook. He did, the person that did the poll. Uh, a few people saw it, a few people noticed, I certainly did. Uh, Joe, you're supposed to be representing your constituents. This isn't a game, you know, where you can, you know, dance up here with your teacup and smile and and and, and make faces. Uh, it's very, it's a very serious matter, and a lot of people uh, were offended by you uh, smiling with your teacup in front of you. It it didn't do you any good. Uh, I think that's about 20 to one that your constituents and people in the town don't want this uh, to go through. And I think you're causing a lot of confusion uh, sitting on the uh, town council and saying that you're really not sure how you're going to vote. Causing a lot of confusion. Uh, I, I think there's some steadfast no's on the board, Mr. Leteri and Mrs. DeMarco. I think everybody should follow suit so no other cities and towns think that we're not 100% uh, against this process where they're going to uh, take away the rights of the people of Winthrop. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other public comment? Yes. Hi, my name is Cassie. Uh, I live in Precinct 6 on Forest Street, and I just want to voice my support for complying with 3A and allowing a diverse housing mix in this town. I live in a triple-decker by the beach, and I love it. I love that I don't have to maintain a yard, and I have the park, and I have the beach right there, and I just think that there was a point in time when triple-deckers were allowed by right, and they should be again. Thank you. Thank you. Any other public comment? There will be, yes. Uh, if you could just stand up to, no, that's okay. It's for, more for TV than for yeah, us. I can, I can project. No, but if you could please just go up to the microphone, okay. that would be great. Thank you so much. I did. Uh, I lost my voice this weekend, so if I if it goes out, I apologize. Mike Kinlan, Precinct Two. Uh, I wanted to speak broadly in support of uh, affordable housing options in the town. Um, it's been a lot of talk about the character of the town, and to me. The character of the town, and this may surprise some people, has very little to do with the way it looks or the proportion of single family to multifamily. You get the sense a lot of times when people talk about the character of the town, they're really talking about, you know, that area between, you know, Pleasant and Court Road that we call the maze, right? It's beautiful, it's gorgeous, it's wonderful, and truly it is, right? But within that, there is also quite a number of, I drove down Bellevue today and saw nothing but, you know, full-size triple-deckers, Two families, I'd be hard pressed to find a single family on that whole street. You never hear anyone talk about Bellevue being out of the character of the town. The point is we need affordable housing for working class people, middle class people who can no longer afford to live here. And that's just a fact. Something has to be done even beyond 3A to be able to maintain that core population of people who, who made this town. My parents grew up very, very poor in this town, very poor in this town. They had opportunities here that they would have not had had they grown up in you know, Dorchester, where my grandfather was from, or rural Maine, where my other grandfather was from. They moved to Winthrop, and my parents were able to have a life that they otherwise wouldn't have had as incredibly poor kids who were on welfare, you know, government cheese, the whole thing. Um, my father's house is now on 55 Cottage Ave, is now valued at over a million dollars. My mother's apartment, where she lived with her six brothers and sisters, 
Uh, last it was on the market was five years ago for $3,000. Who knows now? Four or $5,000. Who can live? My, my grandfather was a cab driver, right? My house has doubled in value in seven years. And everybody wants to say, oh, that's great for my, you know, my equity. I'm less concerned about my equity, more concerned about the fact that I couldn't live here. I sell suits for a living, right? I could not afford my house now. And my friends who love this town, they come here, they see a beautiful community. I brought my friends to CPYC. They were like over the moon for the community that we have here. And then when they, they look and see what it costs to live here, they're like, we could never in a million years. You're going to need a PhD and a job at Vertex to live here in the next five years. What's probably going to happen if we comply with 3A, right, is that we'll negotiate down to some couple, two, three hundred of units. And over the next five, ten years, you might see some stuff popping up on the main streets, right? Revere Street, Shirley Street, here and there. And maybe they give people an opportunity to live here that wouldn't have it otherwise. There needs to be beyond 3A a push to allow, like, the fiber of this community is working class people. And that just doesn't exist anymore. That opportunity doesn't exist anymore. And we need to preserve that opportunity. And that's why I'm speaking through. There's a human cost to inaction. And me personally, I am willing to sit in a few more minutes of traffic if that means that people get the opportunity that my parents had, the opportunity that my daughter is getting right now. Uh, thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> and just for, it, this is just public comment, but just for clarification, 3A is, has no affordable housing component. It is not oh, an affordable sorry. housing component. That's why I'm saying beyond. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Vasily Malios, Precinct 5. I don't need this. Precinct 5. A um, couple of things I'd like to um, address. Uh, last week, uh, the council met. Well, excuse me. Last week, the council was supposed to meet with Augustus, um, the secretary. And I'd like to know why certain uh, members of the committee um, were at the meeting where others were, were not. Um, I don't understand why um, it's been a select few attending these Sunday uh, brunch events with the senator. Um, there is no transparency when there's only a select few of you attending. Um, the second thing I'd like to bring up is that I would request for the town council to have a town-wide forum regarding 3A, inviting the entire town council, the state senator, and the representative to answer questions from the community, pro or against. They need to hear everybody's voice. Um, I'd also like to say that I do agree um, that the town needs to look at avenues outside of 3A with some affordability. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? Yes. Sorry. <clears throat> Tom Dedarian, Precinct 3, uh, Hannah's Domain. Um, <clears throat> I would like to speak in favor of uh, our adopting uh, 3A uh, because it will bring to the town benefits uh, of increased population, increased revenue, increased services as has been the case since the town was founded in 1852. Uh, the town has been growing, revenue is growing, services growing, uh, uh, and it's the direction uh, uh, we need to go. So I am in favor of 3A. Thank you. Thank you. I think it's 1862. Thanks, Tom. Any other comment in this first round of public comment? <coughs> Seeing none, correspondence. Denise? Uh, we did receive some from John O'Reilly. He gave us a listing of the current housing developments in Winthrop. Um, Cassie Pratt, who did already speak about considering the 3A, and John O'Gorman, who opposes the 3A. Thank you. Committee reports, capital assets. He's well, oh, Montana and both of them, right? Correct. All right, we're gonna go to intergovernmental affairs. Councilor Tessinari. Last week, the Committee on Intergovernmental Affairs met on Tuesday.
we discussed the existing agreements between the town and MWRA and Massport. Um, there was a consensus that we need more information on the existing payments that have come in from both of those sources and any other work that they had agreed to do that they had done or had not done. And then also the length of those two agreements not being so favorable to the town. We also discussed um, the issue of getting any out of town the, on the high tide event the Thursday before and the need to have DCR and, M and Mass State Police coordinate with the city of Boston on traffic control at Saratoga and Bennington Street so that folks may be able to exit and enter the town in a reasonable way that um, that that morning was really very difficult for anybody trying to get out of Winthrop because the exit from with the parkway was totally closed off even though the tide gate was not shut and uh, everybody had a basically line up behind traffic going into the Gorman Fort Banks school if you were trying to exit from that side of town. So two issues that we're going to work to address, well that one issue we're going to work to address with state agencies and we're going to uh, continue to work with the council president and the town manager to explore how renegotiation between the town and the authorities will move forward. Our goal is to have those closed out by the end of the calendar year so that we would be informed as to what kind of budgetary impact they would have for FY26. <coughs> That's the report and report. All right, thank you, Councilor Tasneri. And just again, to follow up on that for that committee, that's a, a newly established committee. Uh, this, it's in its second year and it's exactly for that, to, to look at items that are outside the boundaries of Winthrop to look and to talk to our neighbors to see if they could be of help, if there's any issues that we're looking at that have consequences for Winthrop. Um, and we will be, this is the first time, it's, it's kind of crazy, it's been 18 years since we've had this form of government, 19 years, and this is the first time we're actually going to be in negotiations with Massport and MWRA. The contracts were signed right before we uh, took office, basically. There was one, I think, brief adjustment by a previous town manager, um, but this will be the first full round of negotiations. So we will be uh, creating a committee to, uh, to help the negotiation process and to begin that. We have a little less than a year, a little more than a year before they expire, but it's obviously something that we don't want to wait to the last minute, and it obviously will have significant impact on our fiscal 27 um, budget. So um, more to come on that. Thank you, Councilor Tassinari. <clears throat> School department report, I was unable to attend the school, last school committee meeting, but um, it was a relatively brief meeting. Uh, the major topic of discussion other than the budget, which is a continuous topic of discussion uh, going into fiscal 26, uh, uh, 25, um, and the tightness of the budget. But the other discussion point was school choice. School choice was brought up as it is every single year, and it was um, turned away by the school committee. Um, some of that just has to do with um, spacing requirements, right? And um, so it is something that they take a hard look at. We take a hard look at every year, and it was voted down this year, as it has been in the past several years. <clears throat> Town manager's report. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I just wanted to update the council. Um, <coughs> So one of the things before our town planner left, we need to uh, update the zoning to adopt the new uh, national floodplain maps. Uh, there's some updates to those maps and we have to update them in the zoning bylaws. So I'm working with town council. There's a model that they put out and we'll adopt those, bring those changes for uh, first to the planning board. We'll have to have a public hearing on it and then we'll bring it before the council for approval. Uh, we need to do that before July. So we'll, there's some urgency to that. So we'll make sure we get that done. Um, just a quick update on, um, Euro Beach, I know uh, there was some 
Questions about that last time, we did hire a consultant, uh, Epsilon Associates, uh, our environmental scientist is Dwight Dunk. Uh, he's been working with DEP to negotiate a new beach management plan. Um, in the interim, until we have that done, we did get permission to put up the fencing um, and rake by hand to um, get ready for the plovers that are coming this season. So uh, we did get authorization last Friday for that. So we will move forward with that. And then any work we do on the beach with regard to cleanup and whatnot will have to be done by hand and no machinery out there until we get the new beach management plan in place. Um, also, I just want to thank everyone who attended the meeting with Secretary Augustus last uh, Monday. That was a uh, well-attended meeting uh, by the councils that could that made it, and um, I thought it went well. Uh, what we promised at that meeting was to get information um, to the state. They want to take a look at our zoning bylaws, take a look at the districts we have in place, um, some housing counts, upcoming projects, things of that nature. So we're compiling that information now and getting up to them, and, and then they promised to get back to us. And uh, Secretary Augustus did promise to come to town. He wanted to come in for a visit. He just couldn't do it last week. So I think that pretty much summarizes that meeting. But um, they are willing to work with us still, and we're you know, hopefully going to make some progress. But nothing was obviously decided, but we are going to do some more homework. Um, and with that, I'm certainly open to any questions. And I will say one of the items that Secretary Augustus asked for was we, we kept saying how proud we were of the work we've done in the past and how we should be, basically people should be looking at Winthrop as to how to develop properly. And they were looking at the counts of the Center Business District, as town manager just mentioned, and the Waterfront District, which we also created about a dozen years ago. Um, my understanding is the potential count for the CBD is upwards of 575 units. And the Waterfront District, we are still getting an actual number, but mm -hmm. my understanding is those two districts together will exceed the number of units that we have been required to zone through the state. Um, so again, we do thank the secretary for meeting and we will have a further report as soon as we have it. Um, and Councillor Swope, Councillor Swope. Um, Hi. <laughs> <laughs> Councillor Swope, please. Hi, thank you, thank you Mr. Chairman. Um, Tony, um, although I wasn't included in that meeting, I would really like to meet um, Mr. Augustus, when he comes. So I don't know who you're planning to appoint, but or who the chair is planning to appoint, but I just would like my request. And I, I think most of the counselors here could benefit from seeing him if we could plan that accordingly. I don't know if that's in the rules of the game, but I usually, I don't know. <laughs> but I just should express my opinion about that. Um, secondly, I, I was looking at Donna Riley's report and we are building, when we are building, I don't know how many of those, uh, if, of the work that she listed is a matter of, of improvement in a property or how many of those are a change in a property, like a one family going to a two family or two family going to a three family. Is there a way that we could look at that? And by the way, that's not just with you. It seems that to me, that both the, the planning board as well as the committee on appeals, if they could come and talk with us earlier on, I was just talking to Denise about that. I would love to see that those two groups come before us just to talk about how, what the process is, how they go through it, how they handle appeals, what appeals have they turned down, what appeals have they accepted, and is it in the scope of what we have or are those appeals exceptions and should we be making them? So it, it's not a, I'd just like to hear because I'm, I'm not familiar with all of the things that, that Donna had in her report. So if we can have those two groups um, as a request to come earlier rather than later, I think it would be a help in understanding what we're already doing to build housing here. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, Council Ayala. Uh, two quick things. First, uh, just doubling up on what the town council president said, uh, you have to be commended for putting together a very effective presentation that showed the history of this town and its commitment to multifamily uh, housing as, as well as the recent zoning that was, um, that was done in this town. So uh, just hats off uh, to you for pulling that together and shot out. I could, we could see the impact that you were having as we were talking with them 
I believe their perception of uh, Winthrop and how Winthrop has been conducting itself uh, changed remarkably. The other, just a small technical note, um, I believe that the MWRA and Massport agreements end with FY25, so what we have in this year's budget that we're presenting is the last in that string, so that is going to put a lot of pressure, if that's correct, um, that's what the documents seem to imply, having those renegotiated mm -hmm. deals in place by the end of the calendar year uh, is probably necessary in order for those people who are going to put the FY26 budget together to know what's coming from those two important sources. So um, we're probably on a shorter time frame than um, we had hoped, but um, we'll get the work done over the next eight months. Mm -hmm. Council Duras, did you have anything? No. Good. Vice President, um, Council Tessner. Tony, thank you for. Uh, Mr. Manager, thank you very much for uh, that presentation you did for Secretary Augustus. I did not get a chance to see it, but all the accolades. I just want to add my I thanks to the yeah. add my thanks to the um, to the group. I do want to echo what Councilor Swope said about possibly getting um, the the Planning Board and the Zoning Board of Appeals to come to a future Council meeting, or maybe a, maybe that forum that Mr. Malios mentioned to maybe answer questions and give us a little insight into the, their process. I know all their uh, meetings are public and we have the opportunity to go and, and see how they do things. It's just not always, attending one or two meetings is not always gonna give us a, the best insight into to how things are approved, not approved, what variance are, variances are granted and <clears throat> how our planning board is, sees the, the future of, um, of the town. So that's all. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks. <clears throat> Thank you. CDICR? Uh, yes, they did meet. I was uh, not able to attend, but they did um, have a few things they wanted me to report back. They're working on a uh, speaker series um, that they're going to host at the library this, uh, hopefully to kick off this summer and into the fall months. Um, the th theme behind the um, speaker series is going to be Through My Eyes, and they've got uh, speakers that have come and uh, speak about, you know, their life experiences and, you know, diversity and inclusion and, you know, how that impacts them when they live in Winthrop. So they're looking forward to that. Uh, they're also kicking off the planning for the, um, with Senator Edwards' office and my office with the um, Pride Potluck. They'll have that again this June. Um, potentially looking at doing a longer event rather than an evening, maybe a weekend day and adding a few more hours. And um, they've got um, some people uh, still need to be sworn in. They got some candidates with some... Uh, Resignations, but they're uh, they got a lot of good projects coming up, so they wanted me to report that out. Thank you. I like the microphone, you're like DJ Tony. Over here. <laughs> I want the people at home to be able to hear. I get yelled at about not speaking close enough. Uh, policy making committees reports. I do not believe they've met no since our last meeting. meeting. Yes. Um, old business, we had none. New business, we have a few things. The first item under new business is a motion to the town council to vote to appropriate certified free cash as listed below or take any other actions relative thereto and the amount from free cash is $100,000 and the request is that 50,000 goes into compensated absence reserve fund and 50,000 goes into the OPEB trust fund. We will send that to finance. <coughs> There is also a motion that the town council appropriate retained earnings in the Ferry Enterprise Fund in the amount of $20,000 to cover the cost that the fund has or will incur in fiscal 24. Fiscal, uh, these expenses include insurance, fuel, repairs, payroll, etc. The finance office will apply the funds to the various accounts where expenses were occurred, incurred or take any other action relative thereto. The current ferry retained earnings balance is $24,000. Uh, if this request is approved, the balance would be 4,151. That is a enterprise fund that we are keeping open, uh, although we are not, there is no budgetary item for the ferry this year, nor was there in fiscal, uh, nor was there last year. Uh, and this is just cleaning up expenses that were in there. We're keeping the fund open until, you know, any miscellaneous bills that might come in. We also have, and that will also be referred to finance. We also have a motion that the town council appropriate and transfer $13,656.56 from the fund 727 RPAP rideshare to the capital projects account for ADA sidewalk study. 
In fiscal 24, capital plan 52,000 was appropriated for this study. The bids came in higher than anticipated, and this will cover the overage or take any other action relative there too. The current balance is 44,225.70. With this request, if it is passed, the ending balance would be roughly over $30,000. And this is a um, special revenue account where any rideshare rides, Uber, Lyft, whatever, that are originated in Winthrop, the town and municipality, as do other cities and towns, gets a portion of that. And at the end of the year, uh, that money is brought into the town and used for certain roadway expenses. Um, you know, a few years back, we were getting like five or 6,000. Now it's a little bit more than that with more and more people using rideshare. So it is one of the benefits of having more, you know, cars on our roads, using our roads and surfaces and such. Um, so that will also be sent to finance. Now, there is a motion that the town council accept the request from the memorials committee to install a veterans street corner sign at Court and Loring Road in honor of WW2 veteran Daniel Shepard or take any other action relative thereto. Is there a motion? motion. There's a motion by Vice President Belcher. There's a second by Councilor Aiello. Any discussion on this motion? I do want to thank Phil Ronan, who will speak in a second, on taking such quick action on this. Phil, do you have anything to say? Phil Ronan, Veterans Agent, uh, Precinct 3 also. Um, Mr. Shepard is a World War II wounded veteran. He not only served in the North African theater, he also served in the European theater. He was wounded twice. They don't give two Purple Hearts, but he did receive one, and he was boots on the ground, rifle in the hand. He was an infantryman, so to survive two different theaters of war um, is quite a thing. He, his family, the Shepherds, most people in the town know him. A um, couple of boys, one deceased, a couple of girls, well-known, well-liked. Mr. Shepard was highly uh, respected in the town and, um, and in, in various organizations in the town. So my committee, the Memorials Committee, put forward, um, we approved to the council four to zero. Um, we recommend that you vote in favor of Mr. Shepard. Um, so that's all I ask, and we have a couple of, uh, we have multiple things coming up this year that you should all consider coming to. Tomorrow we have a flagpole dedication at the baseball game at, at Veterans Field. I don't know why we never had a flag down Veterans Field, but we will have one now. Tomorrow that's going to be dedicated next Wednesday. Uh, my principal, my friend and neighbor, and a lot of people in this room's principal, John Domenico, the tennis courts down Ingleside, will be named after him. And I would suggest you reading the town manager's blog. It has multiple civic and veteran-related um, events that I think you definitely should try to attend if you have nothing on the docket. Thank you very much. Thank you. Is there any other discussion on the motion? Again, we thank the Shepherd family for their service, for their dad's service, and uh, it's a very worthwhile motion. Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it. Um, motion by Council President Letary to appoint Heather Harris to the Commission for Diversity, Inclusion, and Community Relations for a term to expire June 30th, 2027. Is there a second? Second. Second by Vice President Belcher. Any discussion on the motion? Yes. Could I just hear a little bit more about her, Hannah? Or I think you've got her resume. resume in your, yep, yeah. So the resume is so attached. I saw her resume and I just read it. And I just, if there's any other personal comments you'd like to make about it. I her. don't have any personal comments. I know I did. Um, speak with her. She's very well qualified. Um, I've heard all good things about her, so I support the motion since that's why I'm making it. Thank you. All right. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed no. The ayes have it. Thank you. 
second round of public comment. Yes, Bill, Mr. Schmidt. Yeah. Hi, Bill Schmidt, uh, Precinct uh, 5. I just wanted to uh, applaud uh, Councilor Swope and Councilor Tassinari to talk about the uh, zoning and issues planning board, because as somebody who lives in the community, I don't understand a lot of the zoning we have, and I think, I don't know when you've done a comprehensive review of the zoning in town, but I think it would be a good idea for the planning board to do that. I also know when you had the charter and ordinance review committee last year, one of the recommendations, I believe, was to make a change to the use zoning. So that's something else to look at, but I, th because I think there's a lot of haphazard uh, development going on in the town, and I think I don't know if there's a lot of things that get through the uh, BZA that maybe shouldn't, but I think a, a thorough understanding of how that process happens and maybe some changes to be made would, would make sense. Uh, so thank you. Thank you. Diana. Uh, Diana Viennes, Precinct 2. Um, first of all, I want to just say I'm very happy to see such participation today from people I haven't seen here before. Um, I know there's some like pro folks, uh, pro 3A folks here, so uh, apl applaud you for being here. It's, it's very brave. I know this is a t can be a tough crowd, um, uh, and and uh, nice to put a face to the to the name. Uh, in terms of our planning board and zoning board of appeals and the process that we have today, I can say that as someone who's been intimately involved with this stuff because I have the right to, under our zoning laws, I can go and I can voice my opinion, which is uh, 3A is a bypass of that, um, and I'll, I'll explain why in a second. I can, ta I can say I've taken full advantage of that, and it's not for me. You know, I see something that's going to harm uh, 12 abutters, and I'm there. And I think a few of the folks on this council have seen me be there and speak up for my um, neighbors when I see something that's, that's not going to fit in with the neighborhood, that's going to harm properties. Uh, I, I'll, I will be there because um, that's what this community is all about. I'm just going to read um, what our zoning code says about what the Zoning Board of Appeals and what the Planning Board does, like what their purpose is, okay? Um, so what these public hearings do, this opportunity for public participation does, is uh, they consider the physical characteristics of the property, whether there's adequate parking that can be made available, and they also make sure the proposed development does not derogate from the integrity or character of the neighborhood or surrounding uses, does not create undue traffic congestion or impair pedestrian safety, and does not pose a hazard to public health and safety. That is the purpose of what they do. They serve, a, uh, they have done this for, for centuries, uh, not just in Massachusetts, like that is the purpose of local government and zoning arguably is our opportunity to truly look around and say, is this right for us? Nowhere is that more important than a place like Winthrop where we are so built out that you look out your window and you can touch your neighbors. We are not in a place that has land to build on. So everything we do here impacts the, the area around us and the homes and the people around us. It's a very important function that these bodies serve and to, and to suggest that we should put in place something that would bypass these very important um, bodies is, is just, um, it's amazing to me. Uh, on, on the topic of affordability, so 3A allows Winthrop. So Winthrop can, Winthrop can put as much affordability as we want. Winthrop can require any new developer that comes in here uh, to, to put 20% uh, affordability, make everything 20% affordable, or 100% for that matter. That's our, that's our right today. We can do that. I think this has been a wake-up call, and we absolutely need to evaluate that. It's one thing, actually, I've learned from from the citizens that maybe we need to reevaluate that. Uh, we want our kids to stay here. You know, we don't want them to move uh, when they graduate from college because they can't afford something. We don't want someone who's looking to downsize on a fixed income to have no options and, you know, maybe want to give their house to their, their kids who have a growing family. We don't want that situation. All right. So, so that's, that's a great thing. I think it's a good lesson. 3A is the opposite of that. So what 3A does is it says, hey, Winthrop, you're allowed 
if you want, you're allowed to offer 10%. You're allowed to require a developer to have 10% affordability. But, but in order to even qualify for that 10%, you have to make 80% of the median income in this town. That's $70,000 a year, okay? That's the opposite of what 40B requires. 40B requires 80% or less. That's how you qualify for 40B affordability apartments or, or whatever, whatever, what have you. I know I'm over time, but, but essentially my, my point is, uh, and by the way, if you, if you uh, stray from 40B, that's another problem. Uh, developers can come in and build whatever they want and, and preempt our laws. So I would just say, um, I think we have an opportunity here. I love to see uh, the participation and uh, it's a good conversation, so thank you. Thank you, Diana. Any other public comment? Yes. I'm just Brendan Cooney, Precinct 5. I just wanted to thank Councilor Aiello for holding a really informative flood in 3A session in February. It was uh, some, something that was really needed, I think, for the residents to go to and feel like they had a voice and to learn. I, I think there was a lot of like misunderstanding of the problems that we have down there. Um, so I, I just appreciate it. I, I realized that I was probably annoying over the winter, so I apologize uh, for like the tickets I put in, but I know the DPW's response and Director Kahlo has been really great. Um, clearing up a lot of the misinformation between the neighbors of what was going on and what was really the problem. So. It just seems that there's a plan, and I just want to thank it on record, so thank you. Thank you, and you are not annoying. What's that? You are not annoying. Uh, we appreciate okay. your comments, we really do. <laughs> Jeff. Thank you, Mr. President. Jack Dowd, uh, Precinct 1. I did go to the uh, intergovernmental Affairs Committee to work out some strategies uh, for, for the upcoming uh, discussion about the uh, mitigation with mass water resource and mass port. Uh, we went back and forth for 15 to 20 minutes and I suggested to the committee and uh, Mr. Um, De Ross, Councilor De Ross was there. I'm not sure if you were on the committee. Uh, I'm not. Okay, so I no. just want to know, you, you were sitting behind the desk, so I just wanted to know uh, your, your participation. Yes. So I was the only one in the audience. And, and I, uh, what was discussed there was how to go about this um, new mitigation for both agencies. And I mentioned to uh, Max, the uh, chairman of the uh, committee, that isn't it a great coincidence that both of these contracts come up at the same time? And uh, after that, um, it was discussed that a solution to these mitigation uh, issues is to hire uh, a professional mitigator or a team of mitigators. And if you put out a request for interest to have uh, somebody represent the town, maybe someone just did this last month across the uh, country. You don't have to be here to represent the town, by the way. It can be anybody. I, I would prefer somebody that's not involved in town politics to uh, be in charge of this process. <clears throat> I did mention it at the meeting. I'm not sure how it came across, but that's my interest in this. The other two things I want to mention, of course, is the uh, flooding problem at uh, Yarrow Beach, and it's only gonna get worse. There's no question about it. Right now we have a funnel effect between the rocks off of, uh, the tower, the water tower, and the rocks down Point Shirley uh, that, that are building up uh, to probably 20 feet uh, above what they used to be 20 years ago. I mean, I, I was down there a lot. Uh, and what has happened is it's caused a funnel effect. And we were very lucky with this last storm that it was late in the season. And, and the push was, it wasn't a high, high tide, but the push did reach the wall. So I, I went down and, and, and had conversations with a few people down there, Rowland, and they weren't informed that the berm was gonna be taken down. Uh, it could have been disastrous. Uh, the berm was there for a reason. I think it worked. It's, it's been working for 20 years. What, what the DEP wants to know uh, can be discussed, but it certainly worked, 
and, and I want to be very cautious about what we do down there to protect the houses uh, uh, from a blizzard like 78 or, or 25, even a 25 year storm is going to come right over the wall if there's no berm there. The other issue uh, that was discussed at this meeting was the wall uh, when you leave Winthrop. It starts at the last house on the right and uh, the water streams through there. There's no wall there, that's why it streams through. Uh, myself and, and Chris, my friend, we risked our lives uh, about a month and a half ago to go down there with a six foot level and find out what the story was at that wall. Uh, it was built incorrectly, or it was built at a time where it worked, but now it doesn't work. So at, at six foot, the plumb, it went, it went over 20 inches, and at 12 feet, it's probably over four feet. So the water just rose right over that wall. Uh, that wall is deteriorated. They did do a, uh, a fix of that wall about 10 years ago, and it didn't work. <clears throat> the water comes in. Uh, you have to turn around and go the other way. <clears throat> What's the time, Jim? Four minutes. Thank you. So you have to turn around and go the other way. And Ms. Ariello's uh, uh, comment at that meeting that Max shared was to put a policeman uh, directing traffic in the middle of Bennington Street at Orient Heights. Nobody's going to do that. And, and, be, and besides that, it's ineffective. There's just too many cars there. It's not, it's not getting a car from location to location. There's just too many cars. And so I commented uh, to Joe, uh, you know, what about the issue with the wall? He said, you know how long this is going to take, Jack? It's going to take five years just to get started. I got, I got 30 seconds. It's oh, going to no, take five years over, right. to, to get that wall. And I said, well, Joe, why don't you start today? So somebody has to start here and, and do a rough estimate. You know, the Back to the Beaches program years ago, I uh, brought $40 million or so to the front of the beach. It hasn't flooded since. So now we need another uh, wall to be built. It's about um, 300 yards, no, excuse me, 3,000 feet, I think, of wall from the, fir the first house on the right when you're leaving town to the floodgate. It's about 3,000 feet. So somebody has to put together a figure and bring it to the state in order for us to survive. If the people that work at Deer Island can't get to their job, because of flooding issues or whatever issue uh, crops up from uh, today until the next big storm, we might have a big problem at, uh, at Deer Island. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other public comment? Uh, Mr. Gill. Without getting into any detail, I'm strongly opposed to 3A, and I urge the council to continue to do what what they can to minimize the effect of, of 3A on us. And again, I won't go through all the arguments, but I know that I don't like it, and I don't think it would be anything positive for the town of Winthrop and for our residents. Thank you. Thank you. Former President Gill, Precinct I'm 5. I'm sorry, Peter Gill, Precinct 5. <clears throat> Chief. Good evening. Uh, thank you. I came in late. I apologize. It was a week. Um, but I heard some comments about 3A. Um, you know, what we don't want to be is the vision of Ocean Avenue here, Revere, um, and we don't want to be Suffolk Downs, 10,000 units. Uh, we're going to have enough problems getting in and out of Winthrop, um, so I think we have to be smart about what we endorse and what we bring into the community so we do not uh, interfere with what we have that we call Winthrop today that we want to keep. And I understand that we need more tax revenue, certainly been... <laughs> discussing my budget with the uh, town manager and I completely sympathize with that um, but also on flooding and rising tides wave action it's all it's all a problem right and we're talking about um, the debt exclusion for a public safety building um, but then we have this wave action that is interfering with people's homes and deteriorating walls um, there was a study or a ongoing pilot project done in a, a, by an MIT student who was on 60 Minutes about two months ago, um, and then she's designed these rollers to take the wave action out before it hits the walls. And she estimates that um, <coughs> if the pilot is su successful, there's hundreds of thousands of miles of coastline that could use, utilize this, but why not jump in and try to, and I, I know the town manager has this information, he's, he's reached, reaching out, but I think it's a great idea to reach out and also endorse that pilot project to see what it would do for us on onshore drive. 
what will it do for us? You know, it's, it's not going to help us on Morton Street because that's more a rising level um, than a wave action. But Shore Drive, Tuxbury Street, that eventually will still be flooded again as the sand gets taken out and the rocks get taken out during these coastal storms. Um, so that's just an idea that we got to be smart about um, what we're investing in. Uh, and again, I, I think you know, we have Tylston, Girlstone, Pico, Morton Street are, should be our priorities. Um, saving people's homes should be our priorities uh, as we move forward and when thinking about capital projects. So thank you for your time. Thank you, Chief. Uh, Terry Lanty, Precinct 6. <laughs> Kathleen. Hi, Kathleen Capuccio, uh, 49 Waldemar Avenue. Um, I wasn't going to talk about it tonight, but just when we were, someone was discussing the MWRA, um, I did email um, Fred Lasky, the executive director. Have not heard back from him yet, but um, I'm assuming the council is aware or might not be aware that part of the housing bond bill is the, the governor um, and some of the legislators would like the MWRA to increase their service area to add many, many communities. So I think it would be great if the council could reach out and find out if there's going to be any impacts to Winthrop in connection with that. Um, you know, when obviously the treatment plant was first designed, excuse me, sorry, <laughs> when the treatment plant was first designed, I'm not sure what the capacity was. So I just wanted to bring that up if you're, you know, again, talking about negotiations. Um, again, the current MOU expires June 30th, 2025. So I think it would definitely behoove the town um, to find out if there's going to be any impacts if m numerous communities are added to the service area. Um, and if I get, I, I'm sure I'll get an email back from Fred and I can pass that information along. But I just wanted to mention that. Thank, Thank you. you. Any other public comment? Yes. So, very quick addendum. I know it's not a Q&A, but wondering aloud if there is a place uh, where we're able to see uh, what specific funding is potentially tied um, to 3A as, you know, things have gone down with Milton. Very specifically, they've talked about, I believe it was uh, seawall funding or something of that nature that they actually knew uh, this money was earmarked for X, Y, and Z. I'm not sure if we know the amount or what, if anything, it's earmarked for. Um, I know there is a lot of flood mitigation that needs to be paid for. I am in the flood zone, very much so, off of Morton Street on Fairview. Um, Tepe Corridio's house is the only thing. Uh, she is my seawall, effectively, right now. And uh, eventually, she, you know, that will move around her. And I will be dealing with the ocean instead of her. Um, so wondering these things out loud, uh, I grew concerned at the comments uh, by our state rep, uh, something uh, to the effect of, you know, to the state, we do not want or we do not need uh, your money. When I hear these things, when a lot of people my age, young families in town, when we talk about these things and our concerns, there is a feeling like what is effectively being said there is, we'll let the kids pay for it down the line you know, when everybody else is gone, that ultimately these costs are going to fall on us. We, we don't really appear to be in a position to be refusing money, and certainly there's ways to negotiate for that money. Um, but every cost deferred compounds, I mean, I don't have to tell you guys this, you guys know this, that the, the more you put something off, the more it costs down the line. Uh, and to think that, you know, we might have to put some of these projects on the back burner for lack of funds makes me very concerned about what the ultimate cost is going to be um, to future residents and us in the future. Uh, that's all. Thanks. Thank you. <clears throat> Any other comments? All right. Public relations there, as we said earlier. Um, we will be filling the seat for Precinct 1 Councilor at the next Council meeting, which I believe is May 7th. Uh, that term will run through December 31st, 2025. There are still board members needed for certain committees. Please contact Town Clerk's office. April 22nd, street sweeping begins. Last full week of the month, last week with a Friday, through October between 7 a.m. and 4 p.m. on the day of street trash collection. Um, as was mentioned by Phil Ronan earlier, April 24th, we will have a dedication for John Domenico for the tennis courts down at Ingleside Park. 
One of my favorites, April 27th, we have the Town Rabies Clinic at the Old Middle School, front door, 10 to 1. <laughs> April 27th also is the Chamber of Commerce Community Awards Dinner at CPYC. It is al always a very good event. I encourage people to contact the Chamber for tickets and to attend. Any questions, any uh, Council Tessonary? Anything? Uh, Vice President Belcher? Um, I just wanted to say I went to the firefighters' first annual cornhole tournament this weekend, as well as the police uh, and fire versus Winthrop All-Stars hockey game. So a big congratulations to both the fire department and the police department for really great events this weekend. I assume that's why Consulate DeMarco is not here. He might have had He injury. was in goal for the All-Stars, so, uh, yeah. Consulate Aiello? Uh, just a stellar job by Consulate DeMarco. <laughs> he only let up nine goals, I think. That's the swope. Uh, Tony, I, I want to add my appreciation for your report. I did read it. It did, it was on, it did come off, uh, over to my email. It was beautifully, beautifully done. Thank you. Councilor Dross. Uh, I'm just going to jump on the Tony Marino bandwagon and say <laughs> thank you uh, so much for all the hard work you're doing. I think a lot of the hard work is very visible to everybody in the town. Um, some of it is not always visible because it happens in in meetings where we are flipping through a very large binder. Um, if if people haven't seen it, uh, I thought I brought mine. I didn't. If you could see what 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 Tony calls the budget book, um, it's it's a lot of information in a good way. So if you ever want to be schooled about um, municipal finances and town budgets, um, Tony Marino is a good guy to lead you through it. And as the newbie on the council the last four months and the chair of the finance committee, Tony, I appreciate uh, all of the effort that you go through to make sure we have all the information we need. So thank you. Jim, can I just say one more thank you? Yes. Um, I want to thank DPW. I can drive in, in the Highlands. It's beautifully done. Thank you so much. I know it's a lot of work and I know there's a lot of people that you have to say, please move over. Please don't park here. Please give us a chance, a few days to hit your streets paved. Nice job. Manager? Yeah, I just want to say on the um, thank you, but uh, that's a team effort on the budget book. Department heads, finance team, like I can't do any of it without them, and we have a great team here. So I want to pass the accolades down. They make me look good, and I appreciate that. Thank you. Well, thank everyone for attending the Tony Marino Appreciation Night, and <laughs> ask for a motion to adjourn. Motion. Motion by Vice President Belcher, second by Council Aiello. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, no. The ayes have it. We will take a five-minute recess and start the spring forum. Thanks, everybody. This is um, Charter gives us two opportunities, the fall forum and the spring forum. Uh, fall forum, we normally discuss departments, give highlights of some of the good work they're doing. And um, we did that last fall. This is the spring forum where we focus on uh, the budget and the process in the capital. So without further ado, I'm just going to grab my laptop. Because I'll never be able to see that. All right, Larissa, if you don't mind, thank you. So the FY25 capital plan, uh, similar to last year, it's a five-year plan updated with um, you know, the, the most current year. Uh, we worked closely with the uh, Economic Development and Capital Assets Committee on this plan. Uh, they had a lot of good input. Um, and because of that, we were able to expand this plan this year to include a grant section. Um, it includes an update on uh, total vehicle inventory in the town. Uh, we also included a section on uh, past capital projects for the last two years and where they stand for funding and uh, where, we're, where we're going forward and you know what's left to do on those plans. So we included all that info. It's even more than we had last year, so we were happy with the final product. And again, this is all in the, um, the budgets online, the draft budgets online, proposed budget, and this is all in there under the capital section. Uh, this plan also has, as the council requested we do and we finished, the uh, facilities needs assessment that was done by Brightly. Um, we also use them to manage our day-to-day -day facilities needs. And we also did a water infrastructure capital plan with Wooded and Curran. And these, uh, this capital plan includes projects that are listed in there for you know, upkeep and maintenance over the next five years. And again, as I stated, the FY25 capital plan is available on our website in the proposed FY25 budget. And it is a uh, nice, easy, usually, uh, easily usable uh, PDF, and it's got index in the table of context, so you can just go right to the section you want to see. 
Uh, this is just a highlight of next slide, please. Sorry. This is a highlight of the capital plan. Um, it's uh, broken down by sections of the town. We have uh, facilities town wide. Uh, we list all the buildings out. Um, we've got uh, Pauline Street Gymnasium, E.B. Newton Building, Public Library, uh, Fire and Police Stations, DPW and Highway, and it lists all the projects. Uh, the blue column there in the middle is what we're recommending for this year. Um, so obviously we can't do everything given the limited resources we have, but this is what the, you know, the town manager recommended to the council for approval, um, and they'll have the ultimate sign off. I will highlight there'll be an index at the bottom, but the uh, green lines here in the middle are what we're requesting from the Green Communities Act. Uh, we were lucky enough to get 192,000 and change last year. We're, they allow you to apply for up to 200,000 a year. We've got another 200,000 planned to ask for for this fall, and we're really pushing hard to get these projects done so we can uh, move on to the next phase. Uh, this highlights here is a lot of the, um, we listed the Revere Street tip project in here. That's coming up in FY26. As you see on the funding source at the end, it's being funded by the state. Um, that's approximately 7,500, so sorry, 7.5 million. Um, we've also got the, a lot of the projects here. We've got um, main, the council asked to put in their Main Street tip project design for the um, engineering work to do from the um, Belle Isle Bridge back to the intersection of Pleasant Street. There will be more engineering work to do, but we wanted to get started on that as that seems to be an intersection that in that stretch of road that needs the most work. Uh, we've got some public, we talked about seawalls earlier in the council meeting. There is some public seawall repair money in here, um, the seawall repair around Shirley Street. We started it and we've been uh, incrementally working that way and another 50,000 this year we're asking for. And then sidewalk replacements, DPW director always asks for what he needs. He asked for 200,000. We're proposing 75 this year, um, again, given the constraints. Same with asphalt resurfacing. DPW director asked for 500,000. We were able to fund 300 this year, or we're asking for. Uh, continuing with what we did last year, we've got money in there for tree plantings, $25,000 uh, to put in there, and also the cemetery fund to replace some more fence, uh, 40,000. Now this section here, the uh, brownish orange section here, uh, that might not be coming up on the screen that color, but uh, that's the water and sewer. Uh, we've got, like I said, we got the new water capital plan, water and sewer capital plan from Wood and Curran, and a lot of these projects were listed in here um, to do right away. Um, you know, we got a lot of water main we got to replace. The projects, the last three or four listed at the bottom are the most important. Uh, we've got uh, exercise 500 valves, so if anyone who doesn't know what the valves are, we've got a bunch of shutoff valves in the, on our street. You see the little covers on the street. Um, some of them don't get touched for years, so we need to go in and exercise those, open them, close them. And when we do that, we anticipate a certain percentage will break. So um, you can see that the five-year program to replace older water meters and also um, Another one in there to replace 25 failed gate valves uh, to the tune of, uh, five, we're asking for 500,000 this year. Now we haven't filled in the, other than the 50,000 at the bottom to replace the primary sewage ejector pump. We haven't um, come up with a financing plan yet. This will tie into the water rates, so we're gonna come back with this and find, figure out the best way to do it, whether it's a long-term borrowing to maybe grab the millions of dollars in the front there and just pay principal and interest payments, or to just fund this incremental amount in FY25 and then move forward. We're keeping in mind, you know, increases to the water rate, because this is the capital plan. We don't wanna come and tell everybody we're raising the water rate $3, because that will not be acceptable. Uh, so we're trying to come up with a way to handle this so we can make the water rate increase is manageable but also get the work done so um, I'm gonna work with the finance team on that and see if we can come up with the best way to finance that for this upcoming fiscal year um, we've also got some work that we're asking the Winter Foundation for we don't have an answer yet but we're gonna put the ask in to replace the uh, play structure over at Ingleside Park for 120,000 next slide sorry uh, and then we get into some work at the schools um, the biggest thing here is uh, we've got some smaller things that the schools asked for uh, that we're going to fund this year and some stuff that came out of the um, facilities needs assessment. But the larger one here is uh, replacing the RT rooftop units uh, for heat and AC there on the uh, Fort Bank School. Uh, rooftop unit one and two are both in, uh, need immediate repair. Uh, thankfully, we were able to get some ESSER funding. Um, they're gonna be using the remainder of the ESSER funds to fund part of it, but from the town, we're asking for the uh, 298,281 to get that work done this spring and summer. Uh, then the last little bit, that's that. Next slide, please. 
Uh, as we wrap up, we see some equipment here for the DPW. Uh, we've got a sewer vac truck. We've got one more payment on that. Uh, we asked for money last year. This will pay that off in full, this final $60,000. Um, we're starting a financing plan to replace the trash truck, uh, $70,000 a year for the next uh, three years. That'll get that done. We've got a payment on the uh, fire truck lease payment. Uh, we've got a new pumper that's being produced for us now. It's not in yet, but that's there. And then move down, we've got our standard ask for uh, 58,000 for a new police cruiser, staying with our one per year. And then body cameras, as we approve that, that's 60,000 in here. And then lastly, we've got 10,000 in there for uh, replaced computers throughout the town, uh, the various departments. This is the legend I promised there. You can see the um, yellow signifies the general fund. Um, free cash is the uh, purple. Uh, green communities is the green color. Winthrop Foundation, um, that's the, uh, the brownish color there. Water is blue, and then water and sewer, uh, water waste fund, sorry, uh, that's for the Harbor Master and whatnot, that's blue, and then water and sewer is that uh, brownish orange that we talked about before. Uh, this year, the green communities, we're asking, like I said before, we're asking the funding source there on the left, we got 200,000 from green communities. Um, we're asking for the 298, 281 from free cash for the rooftop units at the school. Capital stabilization, we were asking to move the 946,000 out. Water and sewer enterprise fund retained earnings, we got 110,000. And then the Winthrop Foundation funding request is 120. So the total is 1.674,781 for the capital plan for FY25. You know, the budgeting process this year, as we move forward, uh, obviously we finalized the work on the budget with the department heads, uh, presented the base budget document to the school committee and the finance committee. Uh, the budget will be um, in the Government Finance Officers Association format, GFOA is what we like to call it. Um, draft of the FY25 budget was presented to the Finance Commission and the Finance Committee on April 4th. Um, the final proposed budget will be presented to the Town Council on May 7th. And the Finance Committee has already started. Um, this is post that. They started reviewing the budget and the meeting with the department heads. They started with um, my department and the finance team on April 11th. And they've got meetings coming up over the next, mostly on Thursdays, but a couple of Wednesday meetings over the next month, month and a half. Um, and without further ado, uh, we'll get into what we call the base budget document. I'm going to introduce Sarah Johnson, our finance director. This is our first time with Sarah. Sarah and I worked together in the past, but we were lucky enough to bring her on board. So right when I hasn't met her. Sarah Johnson, this is the team. So. Thank you, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, we started with the uh, base budget document, I believe, last year. And so what this does is it shares the revenue that we get from the town uh, between the schools and the town. And so what you're seeing here at the very top is the FY24 budget total. So the schools had $35,121,803, and the town had $24,486,799. Um, and then we take that revenue, and we back out last year's excluded debt, put in the new year's excluded debt. We um, add back uh, the uh, governor's state aid increases. So we usually get a little more money unless there's like a recession. And then unfortunately, the state does cut some of our state aid. But in this case, we're sharing more of the state aid. And the state tells us, you know, the schools get this much more chapter 70, and then they call it unrestricted government aid or UGA for the uh, town. And so that's shared. And then of the total revenue that we have in addition, the remaining amount was in yellow that says a portion additional FY25 revenue. And that's shared in the same percentage as the prior year's budget, which was in green at the top. And then the last little piece at the bottom is our estimated levy. So I'm sure you've all heard about Prop 2.5 uh, with the state. And so we get our last year's total levy, which is the 34436255 and that is our starting point for next year, FY25. And then we add that prop two and a half or two and a half percent. And so that total is $860,906. And we're estimating that we're going to get $550,000 in new growth next year. So that can be from new developments, that can be from homeowners adding additional space onto their homes. So it's not necessarily renovations, it's more if you're adding a room on your home or a floor on your home. And so that total 
we're hoping to equal 550,000 because this past year's was 511,960. So the total estimated levy that we're expecting is 35,847,161. Can you go to the next slide? Thank you. So the, uh, the starting point that we look at for all of our budgets for the next fiscal year, we look at revenue because towns can get in trouble when they start budgeting to their expenses versus their revenue. And so we always wanna be conservative and look at our revenues first. So we look at what the governor said she would give us for state aid, and then we look at the tax levy because the tax levy is the biggest portion of our revenue. And then the state aid is the next. So it's about 64, 65% that we get from taxation, a little under 25, for the state aid. And then the other thing we, largest piece of the pie of revenue is um, our local receipts. And so we look at how much money we get in motor vehicle excise. And we actually track all the commitments for the past couple of years and we look at how motor vehicle excise can trend. Because unfortunately, in a recession, people don't go out and buy new cars. They keep their cars. They say, no, no, now's not a good time to buy a new car. And so the tax formula that we get for motor vehicle excise, you get more money 90% in the first year of a brand new car. And then it drops to 60, 40, 25, 10. So if everyone is keeping an old car, your motor vehicle excise is gonna drop. But in a good year and a nice economy and no recession, some people will go out and buy new cars. And so you can see that nice increase in motor vehicle excise. So since our economy has been kind of mixed, we budget the level amount. So we budget the same amount for motor vehicle excise. And that's really kind of our biggest source of local receipts. But then you get all the other things like um, your uh, plumbing permits and your gas permit, you know, and your electric permits and your building permits. All of that is considered, you know, local receipts too. So there's a bunch of different local receipts that we have. Um, one of the other nicest ones that we have is the pilot payments from the MBTA and the um, MWRA. And so those are a few million dollars. So that's another nice source of revenue. Those are both like the two biggest ones at about $2 million. And so we add up all of that estimated revenue and we're conservative. And then when you follow the spreadsheet at the top is your, well, the levy was included, then the state, the cherry sheet, but what they give it, they also take it away. <laughs> There's assessments that we get for various programs, the mosquito program, the biggest one is the MBTA. And then also there's school charges too and assessments to the schools. And so those get backed off. So that next little section says state charges. So they give you a lot of money and then they take some away. So the net is about 14 million. There was ARPA money last year, but we're not using any ARPA money this year. So that's kind of a big change, a big hit. That was $225,000 that we're not gonna get this year. And then the um, allowance for abatements. So if someone requests an abatement on their home, we have to set aside money for those abatements. And so previously we set aside 200,000, but our total abatements has been a little bit low. So, well, I should say higher and we wanna build up that account. So in order to do that, we're adding another 25,000 to it. So it's now gonna be 225,000 but you need to back that off of the revenue because it's, you're taking some of that revenue away and holding it aside. So the total estimated receipts there is 20 million to share. We also have some money from various other accounts, cemetery lots, perpetual care, uh, the regional 911, and um, also indirect costs to the town from um, enterprise funds. So all of that money is specifically meant for the town because we can't share that with the school because all those programs and all of that income, you know, we can't give the cemetery money to the schools because we need it for the cemeteries. So that's earmarked just for the town. So when you add all of those funds up, it comes to 61,205,014. And can I go back one slide to the previous slide? And if you look at the total on the kind of middle section off to the far right, equals the exact same amount for that we shared for expenses, 61, 205, 014, and that gives us a balanced budget. Can we go back forward now again? <laughs> Thank you. And then one more slide. Okay, so our GFOA budget 
format, as Tony mentioned, is uh, it promotes best practices in public budgeting. Um, we focus on information, transparency, and accountability. Um, as I mentioned, being conservative, it's really important. Um, we also included department narratives so that that way you know about what the department's mission statements are, um, their goals and objectives and accomplishments that they had the prior fiscal year, and then all of the information is presented in an easy to digest format and we gives you all a great snapshot of the town's finances. Next slide. Okay, is it up? All right. And then the, um, basically this is just giving you a quick look at a format. And this is the town manager's budget. So what we give you is the, we're currently in fiscal year 24. And so we give you the 23 budget. We give you the, what was actually spent in 23. So you can see what was budgeted and what was spent. And then we give you the 24 budget that we're operating within now. And then we gave you the actual expenses through December 31st because we just felt like it's halfway through the year it's easy to figure out you know when you look at it you can just double it and be like okay that'll be pretty close to where we are so we also got uh, department requests and then we have the town managers budget and unfortunately we had like four hundred and seventy five thousand dollars more in department requests than we did for what Tony could authorize because we had to make the cuts or else we wouldn't be balanced. Um, so unfortunately, there were a lot of cuts that had to be made, but Tony did it very responsibly. And I think, you wanna take this one? Thank you, Sarah. So um, lastly, the budget challenges moving forward. Um, you know, we showed the um, dollar value we gave the schools, um, you know, with a lot of the grant money they got over the years and the ARPA money we were able to, you know, put in the budget that sort of masks some of the needs that they've had. But, you know, they have school budget shortfalls. I mean, they've got a substantial one this year. Um, you know, Winthrop's going to need to bring a, a budget override, school override forward for the residents to vote on sooner rather than later. Um, so that's something we want to make everybody aware of. That is coming down the down the pike, the school committee process normally is the school committee will come in and request, you know, for the council to authorize it and to move forward with a vote. Um, so that will happen hopefully in the near future. But that's got to come. And we haven't done one here since 2009, um, you know, with average, you know, increases between 5 and 7% for the schools every year. It's just not re realistic. I think they're going to be able to live within two and a half um, and a little bit of new growth that we get. Uh, funding for large infrastructure projects and new building projects you saw in the capital plan you know we've got you know as I said before you know over 100 million over the next you know 10 years or so uh, we've got a fire and police station water and sewer projects stormwater system repairs and you know and many others um, managing the increased expenses for the town and the school health insurance and other related expenses ie property insurance and everything else as it raised you know those go up I mean for example our health insurance went up almost 10 percent this year and that's not just here, that's everywhere. Um, new collective bargaining agreements are all coming. Uh, we've just, as I advertised at the, uh, talked about at the last council meeting, we settled the fire contract through 2027, but the remaining um, CBA collective bargaining agreements on the town side are all expiring on June 30th, 2025. So we'll start this October uh, negotiating those um, in hopes to have them wrapped up and know our budgetary numbers as we get into the FY26 budget season. Um, and you know, and then I think the school ones are up at the, during the same time frame. So they've got um, uh, a school superintendent will be negotiating at the same with the school uh, the school unions as well. And then obviously dealing with the impacts of sea level rise and the associated costs. You know, we hit on that earlier. Uh, the police chief brought up concerns and what we need to do. And you know, we're trying to do it with grant funding, but you know, at some point the town will have to put money in as well, whether it be matching funds or funding some of the work ourselves. And we're going to need grant funding at all levels, you know, over the next 10 to 20 years to deal with the sea level rise and sea walls and living levees and some of the other options that we're looking at to, you know, address the flooding and to, you know, protect people's homes and the investments they have in town. So that's the um, challenges that we'll have moving forward. So, and that sort of wraps it up. I just sort of an overview and certainly open, willing to ask any questions. If anyone has any? Suzanne? Well, we won't, 
see any water, you know, to say the water rates are going to go down would be, you know, that would be a lie. I can't say that. Uh, we have too many capital projects to do. So the water, the capital the financing for the capital, uh, we will try to reduce, you know, it's called unaccounted for water. You know, most people in town, most towns have an average between, you know, 10 and 17 percent. I think I'm not sure. We think we're a little over that. But we want to, as we replace the water mains, as we fix the gate valves, as we address those issues, that's the sort of the percentage we're shooting for. So that will reduce our usage, which will ultimately reduce the MWRA fee. Um, but yes, that will, as we do that work, that's the goal. Yeah. Yes. But um, it's it's true. We're we're going to have to definitely, and hopefully, we will pass an override. But I think the important thing about the schools too is that with Prop Two and Abbott, it's true. It's true also in, in the town budget. Right. You can't live on that. I can't live on the two and a half. There are some years that I have to put in something that's, that screws up the budget. But the town has to plan on that, and I think you and I spoke about this before, yes. we're going to have to have an override probably every six years, at least on the school side, but right. more. because we have not even met our needs, or, I mean our level budget right. in the last five years. We've been below it. Yeah. So this time it's going to mean, if we don't get an override, it's going to mean cuts in personnel. And that means, you know, that means so, and of course, we can't use the other money that is funded, so that's about 500000 Right. No. Um, and for those who couldn't hear at home, maybe, um, you know, what we talked about is that, you know, when they passed Prop 2.5, it wasn't intended for the town to, towns to constantly live within 2.5%. The reason they passed it was is they wanted to put a cap on local government and put it back in the voters' hands. So if you want to go over 2.5, the voters decide and the communities decide. And that's responsible finances, and that's fine. But, you know, and the communities, you know, you need to plan ahead for that, though, because what Suzanne's talking about is true. You know, I've come from towns where they knew and they've educated the residents that every six to eight years you need a school override. It's just it's not realistic to, you know, with um, most of it being labor and step and lane increases, it's just not realistic to meet the educational needs and live within two and a half percent. And then what you do as well is we talked about at the finance committee is you create an education uh, stabilization fund. So as you go along, you know, you've got, you fund the override in the beginning, it's a little bit more than you need, so you put the extra money in the education stabilization fund, and then you draw from that in future years with the hopes that you might have some turnbacks that they can also put in that account at the end of any given year, and then maybe you can extend that override. So the last town I worked in, they had an override, you know, they planned it for seven years, they were able to extend it out to, I believe, eight or nine uh, before they needed another one. So that's the goal of the education stabilization fund, to always, you know, keep the needs of the school met, but also be able to the best stewards with the town's money and the residents' money. So um, those are the challenges we're going to have to face. That's where the education process comes in. That's where we, you know, get the word out and explain to people why we're asking for it and, you know, what the future's going to be and try to give them the whole picture so it's they not surprised when we come with a fire station, you know, new fire station uh, debt exclusion and, you know, a school override and things like that. People know why we're doing it. And as we stated earlier, these projects don't get any cheaper, you know, the fire station you know, that we didn't just pass, you know, will be even more expensive when we go for it the next time, so. Any other questions? Yeah, just uh, maybe a couple observations and a question. Um, so who's responsible for the bringing this override forward on the schools? We're here in right now April, May before we pass the budget. Um, how, how is the school going to be ready for the next opening, I guess? I don't know, Susan. Suzanne said uh, she's familiar with that budget. So are they going to be able to, you know, absorb the, the punch on their budget this year? Or are they facing layoffs? <coughs> or? I, think, I think Lisa is going to be coming and talking about that. So yeah. Oh. But it's, it's interesting. You know, schools are so critical to us. And I know everyone here cares a lot that they're, that they're well healed. Yeah, no, it's just because I've been through a lot of overrides. Yeah. 2009, and before that, we went for three or four times for a school. We just failed on a debt exclusion. Um, and now we're going to also go for an override and a debt exclusion. So I just want to um, talk about it as much as possible. Yeah. Because if we don't talk about it and don't keep it in the forefront, 
it's forgotten. And at the yeah. same time, we're talking about Morton Street and talking about flooding on Pico. And you know, is that going to be part of an override? Um, should we look, be looking for an override for those things? And then, of course, Miller's Field and the tor turf. Um, they said it's 10 years. Was it 10 million, Jim? Uh, in 10 years, that would have yeah. to come up with a new turf. Uh, where does that fit in as part of the override plan? I guess um, those would be good discussions to have. Well, let it out. The, yeah. the well, I'm just I'm going on a fixed budget, <laughs> so I am getting more and more concerned. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Terry. Those are all great questions. And uh, yes, uh, if we, you know, if they ask for an override this year and don't get it, I mean, I think. This year is going to be challenging, yeah. But there'll be, you know, if we don't find some additional funding sources, and Lisa will talk about that. I believe they'll, you know, there will be layoffs for sure. I mean, I just, um, you know, I don't want to, don't want to sugarcoat that. Uh, with regard to the field, that was one of the reasons I brought the CPA, the Community Preservation Act, forward. Uh, well, that'll be on the, hopefully, it'll be on the ballot in November. One of the advantages of the CPA fund. Um, in the Community Preservation Act is you can use part of it for recreation. So what we can do is as we, uh, it's a slight charge on your tax bill, but the monies are targeted and earmarked for certain things. It's, um, you know, open space, historical preservation, housing, and recreation is the last piece of that. So what you can do, Chief, is we can finance the $800 million that we need to redo the turf and then pay that over a set amount of time using the CPA funds to pay that back. So that's one of the things we, we talked about and, we'll, you know, planning on bringing it forward. Um, and you know, the, with regard to the rest of it, yeah, I mean, it's all going to be challenging. We, Jim and I have had talks about that. Do we, you know, go for a debt exclusion for the stormwater work? We know that's going to be 5 to $7 million for, you know, Pico and Tilestone and Girdlestone. And, you know, or we, do we try to wait and try to get grants for it? So, I mean, that's all conversations we're going to be having. But, yeah, it's a, it's a balancing act for sure. Thank you. Welcome. Mr. Schmidt. Um, so, quite the question, um, and I, I might have missed it there, how, how much money from the budget, town budget is going into enterprise funds. Is that for like trash and parks and recs, et cetera? Was that like 600,000 or something I saw? That? Uh, 660, yeah. 60,000 goes to the uh, 30th piece to the two enterprise park and rec in uh, rink, and then 600,000 to goes to cover the, move over to cover our portion of the trash or a portion of the trash. But those are subject to change if the council wanted to do something else with that money, right? Yes, but we still got to pay the trash bills, right? Because we're not oh, taking. I'm saying you know, is yeah. one option would be to make those accounts totally st sustaining, self-sustaining, yep. and then you would free up that money for things like the school or et Correct. cetera. Yep. I mean, but keep in mind, we'd still be responsible for the town and the school portion. So my guess would be at least a couple hundred thousand of that would still be our trash liability. So we wouldn't get rid of all of it, but you certainly could reduce it. Okay. Um, and I think CPA is a great idea, as I've told yeah. you before. Yes. Yeah. Parks. Um, when I was the acting town manager, uh, every community pays something for their right. parks department yep. because otherwise the fees would be so so increased so high mm -hmm. it would be non-sustainable. And the people who go to our parks department are, are the people who can't afford to go to private yep. um, after-school programs, and so they rely on us uh, for half a day school vacations. So I just want to caution people when when they look at those to really look at the yep. holistically. Um, what's the damage if we do that? So we, I think the director's position has always been paid by almost every other community. Um, it might be one at Arlington or yep. Andover, might, might not, but they get other income coming in there. So yep. I just want to add caution. Thank you. Nope, you are correct. I mean, any town I've worked in, the park and rec director salary always comes out of the general fund monies, and then the programs are, and the cost of that is paid for out of the other. So yeah, that's uh, here we do it a little differently. We've got the 30000 set aside. Uh, we had, did do the fee study. Uh, that group came in. Um, I think Barry and Dunn uh, came in and you know presented to the council. We took a look at the fees. Sean has raised them accordingly. Flag football, all those programs have gone up a little bit to try to you know offset some of that. So, um, but again, you know you, you hear it. You no, know, no one's happy with the increases for sure. So, um, but we are taking a look at that. Thanks, Chief. One more question. Yeah. Do any of the state monies that you talked about here relate? To um, well, the 
two grants we got for analyzing 3A, those would certainly be impacted. But the bigger ones, I mean, the only one, and it was added late in the game, it wasn't in the initial, but uh, Governor Healy added, is the MVP. Uh, the you know MVP grants are what we're going for. That application is due April 24th. We're <clears throat> applying for two. One of them is a priority. The second one, if we can get it, great. Um, is to look at you know the marsh area down by Pico. That's the second one, but the primary one is the Morton Banks. Uh, we're ready to go to design now. We've already done the feasibility study, so it'll be a two-year ask. That's what they're doing them now. So that MVP grant will be for two years, and it would fund the entire design of that project, whichever way we decide to go. What's that? We are. Uh, we're working on the numbers right now. Uh, we'll know those in a week or so. But you know they're going to be upwards of you know six, seven, eight hundred thousand. And that would be affected by 3A. If we were to yeah, if the if, if they were to pull grant monies back and that's on the list, yes, that way we'd be impacted by losing those grant funds, for sure. Anybody else? Sure. How you doing, sir? Sure. Um, 37 years ago, I wrote a series of articles about sea level rise. Mm -hmm. uh, one of which is even uh, on the front page of the transcript. Uh, since then, uh, I've studied coastal geology, and the expenses uh, will be enormous. Uh, and you uh, had a, in your report about grants. Uh, how do we get those grants, and particularly in competition with all the other coastal communities that will be looking for money to, to solve this uh, or mitigate this uh, enormous problem. Uh, I mean, it's competitive. Mm -hmm. Who do we have to do that? I mean, we need personnel to do that. That's a, that's a, a lot, lot of work, a lot of begging, I guess. Yeah, uh, it's my office. It's the uh, was the planner before she left um, recently. So we'll, as we hire a new planner, you know, grant writing and grant, you know, managing the grants is going to be a big part of that job. So uh, that's how we do it. But you know, we're a smaller community, right? Revere and Chelsea probably have two or three people in the grants office. You know, if we can get one, I'll be happy. But you know, always can use more. So, um, but that's where we're at. I mean, there's you know, as you talk about the coastal, there's there's the state money, uh, which is a lot of it comes from the feds. But then as we get to the federal level, there's, you know, FEMA, there's NOAA, there's, you know, a bunch of organizations that will end up hitting and working with to try to layer those grants in to get the work done. And beyond that, it's a, the proposition two and a half override. We're going to have to pay for a lot of this ourselves. Well, that, what you're talking about is be a debt exclusion, right? It'll be a limited time frame financed over 20 to 30 years, the useful life of the, you know, whatever work we're doing. And then, you know, we, if that's the way the council wants to go, that's always an option. But, yeah, absolutely. Uh, and I have to uh, comment uh, on my position, uh, from my position on the town tree committee. Uh, yes. You've heard this before. Uh, Steve has heard this. Uh, yes, we need more trees. We need more personnel to care for trees, uh, to, to, to plant them, uh, to water them. If we have a, if we have a drought this summer, uh, the trees we planted uh, will die. If we don't have a drought, maybe we're okay. Uh, uh, and. I know it's a, it, it's a tough game to decide, oh, do we, do we prune this tree or do we take care of the water main that is broken? Uh, um, we have uh, not enough people to do all this, not enough money to do all this, uh, but I have to just say a word for the trees. Sure. Thank you. <laughs> Anyone else? All right. Well, thank you, everybody. I appreciate it. Uh, thanks for coming out, and have a great night. Thank you.